Coming up, you'll meet Laura Frank, who launches her new song, Leavin', July 8 at Ipswich Civic Centre. Laura has a fresh take on country music, inspired by the likes of Bruce Springsteen, Miley Cyrus and Lady Gaga. Keep listening for Laura's fascinating story of growing up around Calbar and her love of music. It's Tuesday, July 4, 2023, and I'm Alan Roebuck. Welcome to Ipswich Today during NAIDOC Week. This podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which it is produced and pays respects to elders past, present and emerging. Ipswich Today is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. It's an Ipswich Today podcast with a difference. We're going to hear a couple of songs today from Laura Frank. And before chatting with Laura, here's a song she released about three years ago. It's called Things I'd Rather Do. too late. Ipswich and the region is firmly cemented as the home of CMC Rocks and a place to nurture young artists, especially those in the country and alternate country vein. And I'm declaring Laura Frank is a local, hailing from the scenic rim, who, for the best part of 20 years, has been a dancer and competed in hundreds of her Steadfords, among many other things. In January this year, she was awarded Most Promising New Star at Tamworth Country Music Festival's People's Choice Awards. And Laura Frank joins me now. Thank you for speaking with Ipswich today, Laura. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. What a treat. Tell me about growing up around Boona and Calbar and Childwood in particular. Well, you know, as a kid, I feel like lots of kids who grow up in in regional towns are always like, man, I need to leave this place. (laughs) The big (laughs) city lights um, were calling. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Um, No, look, I I had a really lovely childhood, actually. I cannot complain one bit. I grew up on... um, well, a bit of a farm. We had some some cows and pigs for a period of time, but I was always surrounded by animals. So, um, I mean, that was definitely a pro uh, and certainly kind of spawned my love for animals now. Mm. Um, 
But, I mean, growing up, you know, everybody knows everyone. You go to small um, country town schools. So I went to Calbar Primary School and I went to Boona High School. You know, you just, it's this really kind of tight-knit community and that, you, that I mean, I can't say this uh, as, as absolute truth, but I don't feel like you get that kind of thing in the city. So I feel very lucky to have um, grown up here, even if when I was a kid I didn't appreciate it. <laughs> when did you first become interested in music? Well, I started, um, as you mentioned in the intro, I started dancing when I was five um, and then naturally singing kind of comes along with that when, you, when you're doing a Steadfords and you um, compete in uh, song and dances and whatnot. So I started singing through through dancing. And when I was about 12, it was actually um, the academy that I danced at was an Ipswich-based academy, the Wallace Academy. Right. Um, and uh, my dancing teacher at the time was like, hey, Laura, I think you can actually sing. And so from there I was kind of like, oh, cool. I like singing. You know, I'd wait for the bus um, and, and watch it come down the hill as I was in the laundry and sing, you know, random songs to myself. Um, so I like singing and then I just kept kind of doing it from there and I eventually started doing like solo song and dances. Um, and then when I was a teenager, I did a program that came out to the school called Muso Magic, which is run by the um, lovely man who is now my my dear friend, Mr. Adam Thompson, who heads up Chocolate Starfish, if anyone remembers the band. I think we all do. We're all old <laughs> enough to remember Chocolate Starfish. <laughs> and they're, they've kind of, they're, they're back, you know. Yes, they're killing they it at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Um, so he came out to the school and did did a program called Muso Magic. And basically what that is is they come into a school, they write a song with the kids, um, the kids get to record a song. So that was my first experience with actually recording, um, which was awesome. And then um, back in those days, they would actually like produce, you would design the CD artwork um, and like what the front cover would look like and what the CD would look like. And then eventually in a few weeks time, you would get this produced CD back with your, you know, with your song and cover art on it, which was so cool. Well, wow, very special. It was so special. So I ended up doing like I did one, and then I was I was hooked. So <laughs> I ended up doing a bunch of those, um, and then I ended up doing work experience with him because um, I loved it so much. So uh, and if anybody goes onto my website and reads my bio, you'll see that I still do those. <laughs> I still run them now, and we go out to remote. Uh, indigenous communities a lot and work with, um, you know, the community and the schools out there, which is so special. How fantastic that you were a, a participant in the program at school and now you're going back out to schools, particularly yeah. Indigenous communities, and very timely having this chat because it is NAIDOC week with its theme yes, for our elders. So t tell us about a, a typical visit to a school. So we go out for or well, usually four or five days. So what happens, and it's a little bit different to when I did it in school now because, you know, technology has advanced and whatnot. So usually we'll, we'll go into generally Alice Springs uh, on the Sunday. We'll stock up on supplies, um, like, you know, go to the Woolies and, and get all the food that we need for the week, and then we drive out to the community depending where it is and how far away it is. So we drive out there, we, you know, stop in on Sunday night, we go to the school and meet kind of whoever's leading it at that time, might be the principal, might be kind of a teacher, even a community member sometimes, uh, and then we'll set up the space. Uh, and then Monday morning we come in and we do kind of, you know, the, the normal sort of icebreaker games with the kids because, they, you know, everyone's a little bit intimidated and scared when you first walk in that room. And by the end of the week, your best mates, yeah. I bet. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so day one is about writing the song. So we, over a couple of sessions, you know, we'll talk through, generally the school kind of give us a topic that they want to explore um, depending on what's going on in their community at that time. So we'll, you know, talk, to the, talk through kind of what's going on in the community, talk about that topic. Um, it, it really depends. But basically that's how we write the song, by just kind of back and forthing with the kids and talking to them and getting their kind of ideas and we just have a whiteboard and brainstorm um, and then by the end of day one we've generally got a song written 
Um, and then on day two, which is usually the Tuesday, we'll start recording. So we bring the kids in one by one. They record the song. Um, that's most of day two. Day three is mostly about we film a video clip now. So, um, Excellent. you know, mm. we come up with scenes with the kids. They they take us out to their favourite places in the school. We usually do like a, a trip out on country. So there's generally like a creek that they all like to go to or, you know, somewhere kind of special to them that we'll go out. We'll take the drone up. They chase the drone. They just have the best time. Um, so Wednesday and Thursday is about the video and then uh, the team – Usually it's me actually madly editing on Thursday night because on Friday morning we present to the community the song and the video clip finished. How fantastic. Absolutely. Just to give them that mm. opportunity and that confidence to go, oh, hang on, this is actually something that I could explore. Because generally so many of them are so creatively talented, whether it's, you know, artistic or um, singing or playing guitar or anything. Yeah. Actually, a lot of them love to play the drums, mm. which is which is very cool. Now, it wasn't only music you were into. You went into martial arts and running a cafe. <laughs> That's sort of a bit of a step outside of music. <laughs> I did. So, <laughs> look, I, I need to disclose, I didn't actually do much martial arts. It was my partner at the time. Ah. He, was a, he was a professional fighter. Gotcha. And so um, I did a bit of boxing, but – and I, I did – train in some Brazilian jiu-jitsu and whatnot, but I never actually coached that, so I will dis disclose it. <laughs> um, but we did have a strength and conditioning mixed martial arts facility in uh, in Newstead in Brisbane. So there's a moving into Brisbane and a moving out of Brisbane story, yeah. and I hear you had a bit of a light bulb, or was it a, a Netflix moment? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I moved into Brisbane straight after I finished school and did, you know, had the had the couple of businesses, did life there, did other music projects there for about 10 years. And then um, uh, my ex-partner and I broke up um, and I moved into a one-bedroom apartment in the city and um, – I was well. I was with Nick at that time, who is my partner in songwriting and and life. He's my guitarist, and we co-write together and now live together. So I was watching uh, Netflix one night, and we had just had a neighbour, a new neighbour, move in, who we didn't love. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you can get good neighbours and bad neighbours and I feel like he was not a good one. Um, anyway, so this this person moved in and it was very fortunate timing because it was just before COVID hit and we didn't know this at the time so we were just, you know, following our instincts. Anyway, Nick was out on a photography shoot because he's also a photographer um, that night and I was watching Tiny House Nation on Netflix and after, like, I'm the type of person who <laughs> once I get an idea in my head, I'm very impatient and it needs to happen, like, right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was watching this and having this bad neighbour and I was like, man, that looks kind of doable. I reckon I could, I could do this. Um, Impressive. Yeah, well, <laughs> look, I, I wouldn't have done it unless my parents were totally on board, which they were. My dad, um, you know, I called him up as, as I was watching this going, hey, because I had a block of land sitting out in the scenic room that kind of have has been in my family for 40-odd for years. Mm. Um, so I was watching it going, man, I've got this block of land out there that's doing nothing. I'm watching these people build tiny homes going, man, I reckon I could do this. And I called out and I was like, hey, what do you reckon about this idea? And he was just, he was on board straight away. Oh, he loved and, it because his girl was coming home. Oh, yeah. stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, he's a man of few words. So I'm going to believe that that's, that's exactly what he was thinking. <laughs> Um, and then it kind of just spiraled from there. After I'd spoken to Dad, Nick came home and I was like, hey, uh, I think we're going to do this. And Nick, being Nick, was totally on board. He's, you know, the most supportive of me and my ridiculous ideas. And so um, we did. We, we set things in motion. We bought a caravan that we could live in whilst we were building. Um, and we it was like we moved out here 
and started living in the caravan and it would have to be like one or two weeks later that the COVID lockdowns hit hard and everybody was locked in their spaces. And Nick and I just felt so incredibly lucky to have left right before that happened. Yeah. So, yeah, and then and then we spent we spent our um, lockdown time building our house. So, well, um, well, let's just talk about the start of COVID and lockdowns, particularly for live music. It just was mm. it just was the death. There was just no way you could do anything. And then we started seeing people doing live streams of performances. I think one yeah. of the most memorable has been from uh, Jimmy Barnes and his family. But everybody yes. kind of got into that all over the world. What was happening for you? What were you thinking at the time? Yeah, well, we had just kind of not long before that we had decided to become full-time creative. So as I said, Nick was a photographer mm. and he shot mostly live productions So for the Conservatorium in Brisbane. Um, and so, And we were playing cover gigs at that time. So that's how we were kind of living. So when we moved out here and the lockdown happened, it was like the day before and we were like, man, literally everything is going to stop for us right now. Um, And how are we going to get through this? Um, And so, you know, like many Australians, we went to Centrelink and we we begged for um, some help. Some money, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) which – you know, I, I mean, I, I've never had to do it before, and um, it was. It's nice that we have that kind of option in Australia. Mm, yeah. I guess. Did you have the caravan so, by that time? We did. Yeah, because so, it's featured in one of your clips, or maybe more than yeah, one. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> um, yeah, we lived in the caravan for just over a year. Um, I think just down from my mum and dad's house, which was kind of nice, but also sometimes a little too close for comfort. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, everything stopped uh, for us and we put our heads into building our house and we were doing the live streams like everybody else. And I, um, you know, there was this great idea that that I saw that was going around about a virtual tip jar and Ah. it meant – yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. People could tune into your live stream and and decide whether they wanted to donate some money to help you continue be creative and live. So we had a few people who who would do that fairly regularly for us, which was, you know, the community and the support that I have received for my career is just so incredible. I'm blown away by it daily. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah. We'll keep talking about the music in a moment, but I just wanted to digress a little bit because we're mm. chatting on a podcast and you've even dabbled in the world of podcasts. It's called yeah. Franks for Listening. Now, why did you tackle that? Well, I don't know. I <laughs> Something to do? It just felt like, you know, I've seen, I have, I've had a couple of friends who were producing podcasts and, you know, I had listened to a handful of podcasts and I was like, this seems like a really cool thing that Nick and I can achieve. Mm. Um, you know, we kind of have the skills to record and a lot of the time people kind of comment on the way that Nick and I interact on stage. And so it kind of became a way for us to I guess, bottle that up and put it into an actual show outside of just being on stage playing live music. So we we gave it a go and it was, you know, it was so fun. I felt so fancy recording my podcast. (laughs) (laughs) It was so good. Um, And we do have plans for another one, but Uh, it's one of those jobs that we keep going, oh, I really want to do that. And then, you know, things come up and you never get to it. But it's definitely on the cards. Um, It'll be a little bit different. And it's still out there for people to listen to. So I'll put a link in the show notes for that one. Thank you. Let's talk more about your music. Roughly how many songs have you released? Oh, as Laura Frank, I think there are, I think there are eight now. Mm. No, that can't be right. Is there eight? Goodness. <laughs> How much time do you spend on the road performing these days? Now that we can, we're out of COVID lockdowns. Yeah, well, since since the lockdowns lifted, uh, we've been busier than ever. Uh, we were so we're full time musicians for a long time, and that kind of was our, you know, number one source of income. So we were playing a bunch of shows, uh, you know, every weekend. Sometimes we'd be playing up to five shows in a weekend um, and we'd be bouncing from place to place. And a lot of our kind of work uh, during COVID came from Toowoomba because they didn't 
ever locked down. We would drive up there when we were allowed to, of course. So um, we've been travelling around quite a bit, although this year we've kind of shifted our focus because we really want to move into focusing on our original music and, and writing it and playing original shows rather than going to pubs and playing cover gigs. Yeah. No, fair enough. Well, let's talk about that. You'll be at Ipswich Civic Centre Saturday, yeah. July 8 for one show only to, and to officially launch your latest single called Leaven. Yes. Take us inside the creative process of writing this one. Oh, well, good good segue because it, it came about in that period of time where we were playing like five or six cover gigs in a weekend. And I've said this a bunch of times now, but not everybody always loves their day job. So... And that's that's what it kind of became, you know. Like I love singing and I'm passionate about writing music and telling stories and, and singing. But when you're doing it, like, you know, we, we would be playing music sometimes 15 to 20 hours in a weekend and it becomes a lot. It is a lot. Wow. <laughs> um, and so people love the songs that they love and so you, like it's the first time for them to request that song that you sing, yes. but it's about the fifth time in the weekend that you've had that request. <laughs> so it can it can become a little tedious and, you, and it's not like you can be on stage and go, oh, man, please, people, stop asking me to play. You know, you've got to be on and, and put on the show. That's it. So that's where that's where leaving came from for me. It was kind of a place of feeling like, man, is this the only way that I can be a musician? Is this really the way to kind of get to where I want to go? Well, stay talking about this song, Leaven, because mm. I hear you were recently invited to a, to speak and perform at a Queensland correctional facility, I was. which saw many of the hard men in there uh, sort of, you know, uh, bring down their tough veneer, and they really resonated with Leaven, but in an entirely different way to you were thinking. Yes. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> and I mean, I never thought that I would step foot in a prison and I feel so grateful to have been asked to be involved. Um, and, you know, we went in there and had a conversation with a bunch of men and they were just the most engaged audience that I have ever performed to. And as you say, we played Leaven and, you know, after we played it, there was just kind of this solemn, like, reflection and, and that kind of energy in the room because if you I mean if you listen to the lyric you can definitely understand like I suppose how that they would relate to that particular song and and one of the men were like man it feels like you wrote that sitting mm. on that hill over there so yeah it was that was really special you've got a really nice video to go Thanks. with Levin, <laughs> uh, which is already on YouTube only came out in the last uh, few days and it's a 100% in-house production. Uh, how did you come up with the concept for the video? It is. Well, we knew that we wanted to keep it simple, you know, to pay tribute kind of to the song and, and the fear of the song. You know, all these ideas come into your head when you're listening to the chorus and it's, you know, obviously it refers to trains and just leaving on a train. So naturally you go, oh, yeah, you should sit on a train and look out the window and, you know, do all those lovely kind of train shots. And, you know, we toyed around with that for, for a fair bit of time. But me being Laura Frank, I like to <laughs> not go with the obvious choice and try and you know, choose something that's a little bit left of centre. Mm. And so instead of doing the typical on the train shot, we decided that we would create a form of train station. And what would happen in the story is that I would be waiting at this train station and I would my train would never come. And through this t period of time, people would, would come and go and they would leave their baggage with me, which is kind of, you know, pays homage to when people kind of enter your life and, and um, you know, they always leave some yeah. kind of mark. Exactly. So, mm. yeah, it became, it became that story and, um, you know, and then at the end it's, I guess it's up to the viewer to decide whether I actually get to leave or if I'm stuck there for the rest of my days. <laughs> <laughs> this is a podcast without pictures, but you can check out the video on YouTube. And again, I'll put a link in the show notes. And on that note, Laura Frank, it's been fabulous to have a chat and we'll have a listen to your song right now. Thank you. I'm on my way again 
It feels so close in and out. Be gone for a while. I've been. Lucky they can read my mind. I don't know where these trains go, but I'm never coming back again. I'll just sit and watch the trains roll by. I don't know where these trains go, but I'm never coming back here again. I've got. Frank and her new song, Leaving. That's it for this episode of Ipswich Today. Don't forget to look for those handy links in the show notes. Ipswich Today is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. This podcast is also listener-supported. Please make a once-only gift or regular donation to help keep it online. Just go to ipswichtoday.com.au and click the donate button on the homepage to make a payment through PayPal. Follow and stream this podcast from your favourite app, including iHeartRadio and Amazon Music, or play Ipswich Today on smart speakers. Music is supplied by Purple Planet Music. This is Alan Roebuck. Thank you for listening.